A sweeping scimitar swung towards Grigna's head in a shadowed blur of motion. With axe raised over his head, Grigna prepared to parry the blow while gaping wide ye eyed in open mouth perplexity. Suddenly, a sharp snap resounded behind the flopping shaman. The scimitar, halfway through its fatal sweep, dropped from a quivering, nerveless hand, clattering harmlessly to the stonage. Cutting his screech short with a bubbling red mouthed gurgle, the lacerated acolyte staggered under the pressure of the released springboard. After a moment of hopeless struggling, the shaman buckled, sprawling face down in a widening pool of blood and entrails, his regal purple robe blending enhancingly with the swirling streams of crimson. Mrifk, I thought I had killed the last of those dogs, muttered Grigna in a half apathetic state. Nay, Grigner, you doubtless grew careless while giving vent to your lusts. But let us not tarry any long, lest we overtax the fates. The paths leading to freedom will soon be barred. The wretch's crease must certainly have attracted unwanted attention. The wench mused. By what direction shall we pursue our flight? Up that stair and down the corridor, a short distance is the concealed entrance to a tunnel seldom used by others than the prince, and known to few others save the prince's royalty. It is used mainly by the prince when he wishes to take leave of the palace in secret. It is not always in the prince's best interest to leave his chateau in public view. Even while under heavy guard, he is often assaulted by handling stones and rotting flutes. The commoners have little love for him. Lectured the near lady. It is amazing that they would ever have left a pig like him become their ruler. I should imagine that his people would rise up and crucify him like the dog he is. Alas, Grigner, it is not as simple as all that. His soldiers are well paid by him. So long as he keeps their wages up, they will carry out his damned wishes. The crude implements of the common folk would never stand up under an onslaught of forged blades and protective armor. They would be going to their own slaughter. Stated Carthena to a confused but angered Grigner as they topped the stairway. Yet how can they bear to live under such oppression? I would sooner die beneath the sword than live under such a dog's command. Added Grigner as the pair stalked down the hall in the direction opposite that in which Grigner had come. But all men are not of the same mold that you are born of. They choose to live as they are so as to save their filthy necks from the chopping block. Returned Carthena in a disgusted tone as she cast an apiesed glance towards the stalwart figure at her side, whose left arm was wound dexterously about her slim waist, his slowly waning torch casting their images in intermingling wisps as it dangled from his left hand. Presently, Carthena came upon the panel, other granite slabs indiscernible only by the burned out cresset above it. As I push the cresset aside, push the panel inwards. Carthena motioned to the panel she was referring to, and twisted the cresset in a counterclockwise motion. Grigner braced his right shoulder against the walling, concentrating the force of his bulk against it. The slab gradually swung inward with a slight grating sound. Carthena stooped beneath Grigner's corded arms and crawled upon all fours into the passage beyond. Grigner followed after easing the slab back into place. Winding before the pair was a dark, musty tunnel, exhibiting tangled spider webs from its ceiling to wall, and an oozing, sickly slime running lazily upon its floor. Hanging from the chipped wall upon Grigner's right side was a half-molded corpse, its gray flecking arms held in place by rusted iron manacles. Carthena flinched back into Grigner's arms at sight of the leering set in an ugly, distorted grimace, staring horribly at her from hollow gaping sockets. This alcove must also be used by Agathim as a torture chamber. I wonder how many of his enemies have disappeared into these haunts, never to be heard from again. Pondered the hulking brute. Let us flee before we are also caught within Agathim's ghastly clutches. The exit from this tunnel cannot be very far from here. Said Carthena with a slight sob to her voice as she sagged in Grigna's encompassing embrace. Aye, 
It will be best to be finished with this corridor as soon as it is possible. But why do you flinch from the sight of death so? Rift, you have seen much death this day without exhibiting such emotions, exclaimed Grigna as he led her trembling form along the dingy confines. The man hanging from the wall was Doyanta. He had committed the folly of showing affections for me in front of Agafim. He never meant any harm by his actions. At this, Kathina broke into a slow, steady whimpering, chocking her voice with gasping sobs. There was never anything between us, yet Agafim did this to him. The beast! May the demons of hell's deepest hearts claw away in his wretched flesh for this merciless act! She prayed. I detect that you felt more for this fellow than you wish to let on, but enough of this, we can talk of such matters after we are once more free to do so. With this, Grigna lifted the grieved female to her feet and strode onward down the corridor, supporting the bulk of her weight with his surging left arm. Presently, a dim light was perceptibly filtering into the tunnel, casting a dim reddish hue upon the moldy wall of the passage's grim confines. Carthina had ceased her whimpering and partially regained her composure. The tunnel's end must be nearing. The rays of sunlight are beginning to seep into the- Grigna clamied his right hand over Carthina's mouth and with a slight struggle pulled her over to the shadows at the right-hand wall of the path, while at the same time thrusting his torch beneath an overhanging stone to smother its flickering rays. Be silent. I can hear footfalls approaching throughout the tunnel, growled Grigna in a hushed tone. Is corralled at the far end of the tunnel. That is a further sign that we are nearing our goal. She stated? All that you hear is less than I hear. I heard footsteps coming towards us. Silence yourself that we may find out whom we are being brought into contact with. I doubt that any would have thought as yet of searching this passage for us. The advantage of surprise will be upon our side. Grigna warned. Carthina cast her eyes downward and ceased any further pursuit towards conversation, an irritating habit in which she had gained an amazing proficiency. Two figures came into the pair's view from around a turn in the tunnel. They were clothed in rich, luxuriant silks and rambling oh on in conversation while ignorant of their crouching foes waiting in an ambush ahead. That barbarian dog is cringing beneath the weight of the lash at this moment, sire. He shall cause no more disturbance. Aye, and so it is with any who dare to cross the path of Sargon's chosen one, said the second man. But the peasants are showing signs of growing unrest. They complain that they cannot feed their families while burdened with your taxes. I shall teach those sluts the meaning of humility. Order an immediate increase upon their taxes. They dare to question my sovereign authority? Ha! They shall soon learn what true oppression can be. I will... A shadowed bulk leapt from behind a jutting promontory as it brought down a double-edged axe with the sped of a striking thought. One of the nobles sagged lifeless to the ground, skull split to the teeth. Grigna gasped as he observed the bisected face in its leering death agonies. It was Agathant. The dead man's comrade, having recovered from his shock, drew a jewel-encrusted dagger from beneath the folds of his robe and lunged toward the barbarian's back. Grigna spun at the sound from behind and smashed down his crimson axe once more. His antagonist lunged, howling to a stream of stagnant green water, grasping a spouting stump that had once been a wrist. Grigna raised his axe over his head and prepared to finish the incomplete job, but was deterred halfway through his lunge by a frenzied screech from behind. Carthina leapt to the head of the writhing figure, plunging a smoldering torch into the agonized face. The howls increased in their horrid intensity, stifled by the sizzling of roasting flesh, then died down until the man was reduced to a blubbering mass of squirming, insensate flesh. Grigna advanced to Carthina's side, wincing slightly from the putrid aroma of charred flesh that rose in a puff of thick white smog throughout the chamber. Carthina reeled slightly, staring dacedly downward at her gruesome handiwork. I had to do it! It was Agafim! I had to! she exclaimed. 
Sargon should be more careful of his right-hand men, added Grigna, a smug grin upon his lips. But to hell with Sargon for now, the stench is becoming bothersome to me. With that, Grigna grasped Carthena around the waist, leading her around the bend in the cave and into the open. A ball of feral red was rising through the mists of the eastern horizon, dissipating the slinking shadows of the night. A coral stood before the pair, enclosing two grazing mares. Grigna reached into a weighted down leather pouch dangling at his side and drew forth the scintillant red emerald he had obtained from the bloated idol. Raising it toward the sun, he said, We shall do well with Bobble, eh? Carthena gaped at the gem, gasping in a terrified manner. The Eye of Argon! Oh, Kala! At this, the gem gave off a blinding glow, then dribbled through Grigna's fingers in a slimy red ooze. Grigna stepped back, pushing Carthena behind him. The droplets of slime slowly converged into a pulsating jelly-like mass. A single opening transfixed the blob, four minth into a leech-like maw. Then the hideous transgressor of nature flowed towards Grigna, a trail of greenish slime lingering behind it. The single gap puckered repeatedly, emitting a ghastly sucking sound. Grigna spread his legs into a battle stance, stealing his quivering fuse for a battle royal with a thing he knew not how to fight. Carthena wound her arms about her protector's neck, mumbling, Kill it! Kill! While her entire body trembled. The thing was almost upon Grigna when he buried his axe into the grisly maw. It passed through the blob and clanged upon the ground. Grigna drew his axe back with a film of yellow-green slime clinging to the blade. The thing was seemingly unaffected. Then it started to sluice up his leg. The hairs upon his nape stood it on end from the slimy feel of the thing's bully bulk. The knot a sucking sound became louder, and Grigna felt the blood being drawn from his body. With each hiss of hideous pucker, the thing increased in size. Grigna shook his foot about madly in an effort to dislodge the blob, but it clung like a leech, still feeding upon his rapidly draining life fluid. He grasped with his hands, trying to rip it off, but only found his hands entangled in a sickly glue-like substance. The slimy thing continued its puckering, now having grown the size of Grigna's leg from its vampiric feast. Grigna began to reel and stagger under the blob, his chalk-white face and faltering muscles attesting to the gigantic loss of blood. Carthena slipped from Grigna in a death-like faint, a morrow chilling scream upon her red rubish lips. In final desperation, Grigna grasped the smoldering torch upon the ground and plunged it into the reeking maw of the travestry. A shudder passed through the thing. Grigna felt the blackness closing upon his eyes, but held on with the last ebb of his rapidly waning vitality. He could feel its grip lessening as a hideous gurgling sound erupted from the writhing maw. The jelly-like mass began to bubble like a vat of boiling tar as quavers passed up and down its entire form. With a sloshing plop, the thing fell to the ground, evaporating in a thick scarlet cloud until it reattained its original size. It remained thus for a moment as the puckered maw took the shape of a protruding red eyeball, the pupil of which seemed to unravel before it the tale of creation. How a shapeless mass slithered from the quagmires of the stigmatic pool of time, only to degenerate into a leprosy of avaricious lust. In that fleeting moment, the grim mystery of life was revealed before Grigna's ensnared gaze. The eyeball's glare turned to a sudden plea of mercy, a plea for the whole of humanity. Then the blob began to quiver with violent convulsions. The eyeball shattered into a thousand tiny fragments and evaporated in a curling wisp of scarlet mist. The very ground below the thing began to vibrate and swallow it up with a belch. The thing was gone forever. All that remained was a dark red blotch upon the face of the earth, blotching things up. Shaking his head, his shaggy mane to clear the jumbled fragments of his mind, Grigna tossed the limp female over his shoulders. Mounting one of the disgruntled mares and leading the other, the weary scarred barbarian trooted slowly off into the horizon. 
to become a tiny pinpoint in a filtered file of swirling blue mists, leaving the nobles, soldiers, and peasants to replace the missing monarch. Long leave the king. What an adventure this has been. I want to thank you all for coming on this exciting tour of Gorzom with me, particularly all of my amazing Patreon supporters, especially Michael Fittori, Zanazira, Break System BSE, and Zachary Snowden-Smith. I must confess to a certain melancholy that our time here in Gorzom is done, but not to worry, there will be all sorts of great adventures coming up soon, and some familiar lands that we'll be revisiting. I cannot wait to share it with you. But in the meantime, thank you for watching, and thanks for being you.